Praise the Lord, everybody. God is so good. I'm happy to be in the house of God this morning. Amen. Can we love God together? Lord Almighty, we love you so very much. Jesus, there is none other like you. We worship and we adore you right now. Lord, I pray that you have your hand on this service, have your will and your way in this place. Lord, move over our hearts, move over our minds, help us to receive what you have for us today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah.
God is so good. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we could turn them to the book of Psalms, chapter 1. And I'm going to read the whole chapter and then we will be seated. Psalms chapter 1 and verse 1 says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they are, they are like the chaff in the wind, at which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You can be seated. Today I want to talk about a blessed life. So what does it mean to be blessed? What is your first thought when you think of being blessed? Oftentimes, and I know it is for me, it's my bank account's okay. I'm being taken care of that way. My cars are running good. The house doesn't have any problems. My family is healthy. Right? right, right. A lot of times, I think... If I have six figures in my bank account, I'm doing, I'm blessed, right? I'm just pulling numbers out of the air. But <laughs> if I've got six figures in my bank account, then I must be blessed. If my cars are running good, then I must be blessed. If my family is all healthy, everybody's doing okay, then I must be blessed. But that's not always the case. And the problem with that mentality is that it leads people to believe the ones that are blessed are not. I must not be blessed because I've only got $200 in my bank account. I must not be blessed because we're down to one car. I must not be blessed because so-and-so in my family has got to go in for some x-rays or this or that. The problem with thinking like this is that the people that are not blessed might think that they are. You know, because I've got all this, because I've got this, I must be blessed. The problem with that is it leads people to believe the wrong thing. This perceived concept of blessing emanates from self-interest, from humankind. The second idea of what it means to be blessed comes from the Word of God. In this concept, blessing is not determined by what we have, but by whom we have. Blessing is not predicated upon things that we possess, but in being in the right relationship with God. Luke 12 and 15 says, For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things that which he possesseth. A blessed person walks within the scope and the will of the Word of God. In this lesson today, we're going to learn... We're going to uh, learn God's definition of a blessed life. We'll also learn the rewards for living a blessed life. So starting off in Psalms 1 and verse 1. The psalmist began his definition of a blessed man by defining his actions. It's been said that a person's actions are the window to his heart. The psalmist therefore set his pen to describe what a blessed man does not do. Starts off, a blessed person does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Now that word counsel comes from the Hebrew word estah, which means advice. Moffat's translation of the Bible here says, happy is the man who never goes by the advice of the ungodly. In our world today, there are a lot of voices that will give counsel to anybody yeah. who will hear. Yeah. They will say whatever 
they can say to make anybody hear. Right. They will say to anybody who's willing to listen, they will talk. But a blessed person, a blessed person seeking to live a blessed life will not follow the advice of those who are ungodly. Following godly counsel contributes to the state of blessing in a person's life. Refusing to follow godly counsel, however, can bring disastrous results. If we go to the book of Exodus chapter 18 and verse 17, it talks about Moses. Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that you do is not good. You will surely wear away both you and the people that are with you. For the thing that you do is too heavy for thee. You are not able to perform it yourself alone. What he was doing is he's going through and he was taking every single complaint, every problem. They were going straight to Moses. Moses, I can't find my glasses. And Moses would try and help him find the glasses. And then he'd come back and, Moses, I stubbed my big toe. We need to move this tent a little bit over. And Moses would, okay, we're good. And every little complaint and every problem, he was wearing himself down. He was booked six months in advance and no time, no room for the big problems that were coming. And so his father-in-law is coming to him and saying, you need to break it down. You're going to wear yourself out. You're going to wear yourself down. Now, there are an innumerable amount of instances recorded in Scripture of those who offered ungodly advice. A significant example of such negative advice can be found in 1 Kings 12 and verse 6. It says, King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon, his father, while he, was, while he had yet lived, and said, How do you advise that I answer this people? What should I say to the people? And they spake unto him, the, the wise, the old men, saying, If you will be a servant unto the people this day, and will serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. They will be with you forever. And he forsook the counsel. Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him. And he instead consulted with the young men that were grown up with him. In other words, his peers, the people that he had grown up with him, which stood before him. And he said unto them, what do you say I should do? What do you speak to me? They said, make sure, or when you speak to them, make the yoke, which the, I'm losing my place, sorry. Saying, make the yoke which thy father did put on us lighter. When they're saying, hey, make make the burden to us lighter, what should I answer? And they said, everybody that was grown up with him spake unto him, saying, thus shalt thou speak unto the people, which you spoke unto them, saying, thy father has made your yoke heavy, but... Behold, you want it lighter, thou shalt not say unto them, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time reading it so far away. (laughs) The young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people, saying, Spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but thou shalt make it lighter unto us. Thou shalt say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. Now, whereas my father did lay to you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father has chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came unto Rehoboam the third day as the king had appointed, saying, come to me again the third day. Come back. I'm going to think about this. So they came back. The king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy. I will add to your yoke. I will make your... I will, my father chastise you with whips, I'll chastise you with scorpions. And verse 15. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by and the Shilonite unto Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Verse 16. Is this 16? There should be. No, there's no 16. There is a 16. So when all Israel saw that king, the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king saying, hang on a second, what's up with this? They said, hold on. What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house. David 
So Israel departed unto their tents, but as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So what did we just read? We read the divide. We read about how Rehoboam went to the elders, said, how should I answer this? What should I say? They gave him good counsel, but he ignored it. Then he goes to his peers, saying, what should I say? And they say, you know what? Let's make it easier on ourselves. Let's have a little fun with this. This doesn't sound like something that was going to work out for our benefit. Make their yoke heavier. Chastise them with scorpions. Say, I'm the king. You're supposed to serve me. And that caused the nation to divide. Rehoboam refused to listen to godly counsel. Continuing in Psalms 1 and verse 1, a blessed person does not stand in the way of sinners. Now, this statement could have a twofold meaning. This statement could have a twofold meaning. First, a blessed person does not walk in the sinner's path. One person said it well, saying, The blessed man does not loiter in the way taken by sinners. I think that's a pretty interesting way to look at it. Proverbs 14 and 12 says, There is a way which seems right unto, the, to, unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The second way we could look at this, the second idea that we could read, a blessed man or a blessed person does not walk or does not stand in the way of sinners. You could read that as saying, don't be a stumbling block. A blessed person is not a stumbling block for a sinner. If a sinner is someone's trying to get to Christ, you should be like a stepping stone. A blessed person should be like a stepping stone, helping them get to Christ, not getting in their way, not stumbling them up. Lastly, of verse 1, a blessed person does not sit in the seat of the scornful. Now, if you look at this progression, it starts off with getting advice. And then it's walking in the way of the sinners, and then it ends up with the seat of the scornful. The seat of the scornful is a place where individuals disbelieve God. But it's more than just unbelief. It is hatred. It is not only unbelief, but it is trying to actively disprove God. The seat of the scornful is actively trying to disprove God. It's, uh, it's a seat of antagonism and hatred. It is an attitude that opposes God and his word, denying his very existence. So what are things that a blessed person does do? If we go to Psalms chapter 1 and verse 2, a blessed person delights in the law of the Lord. The word delight means to have pleasure, to please. The blessed man is pleased by and finds pleasure in the law of God. Joy comes to the blessed person as they put God first in their life. So, were God's laws written as a cruel master just trying to lay subject to all of his subjects? Was it set up? No, it, God is a loving father trying to take care of his children. I, it's the same way as you would tell your own children, don't touch the hot stove. Right. Don't touch the stove, you don't know if it's hot. I can live my way the way I want to live. It's only hot when you're cooking. Don't play in traffic. Right? I lived on a street. Uh, I lived on 7th Street, and I lived on Road N. The traffic on both of those streets are very different. 7th Street, cars all the time. You go outside, there are cars all the time. Abs day and night. I remember one time trying to stay awake until there were no cars on the street. I failed. And then you've got Road N, which is out in the middle of nowhere. If you're lucky, if traffic is busy, there's one car every hour. Two very different opposing, but the rule was still the same. Don't play in the street. 
well, there are no cars around. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live. Well, if you do that, you're going to get hit. <laughs> blessed is a person who delights in the word of God. The blessed man understands that the word of God and his laws were not written to make life miserable, but to make life livable. Continuing in verse 2, a blessed person meditates on God's word. Now, the word meditate means to remember, to muse, to think, to go over and over. It's not the same like the, the om, om. It's not that kind of meditating. Not that. Meditate to think on, to dive into, to study, to, to really dig through. I, the purpose of meditation is clear from Joshua 1 and 8. It says, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Biblical meditation is more than just an intellectual exercise. It's not just, I need to do some chin-ups for my brain, right? It's not about working your brain out. It's actually diving down into and trying to understand and trying to read. You can, you can read the Bible once and not get, any, not, not get everything from it. You can get so much, and you could read one scripture, and it completely changes your day. It changes the way you think. The next day, you could read the same scripture and get a whole completely different set of everything from it. It's amazing like that. And so it's meditate is meaning to really dig deep into it to try and understand more about it. You look at the history. You look at the, who was speaking it. You look at why they were saying it. Who were they saying it to? When were they saying it? You can start to learn and grasp and connect dots. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Uh, meditation on the scriptures is to be ongoing and continuous. 1 Timothy 4, 15 through 16 says, Meditate upon these things. Give yourself wholly to them, that, they, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, and unto, the, and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt, be, thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. James 1 and 22 says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholds himself and he goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh unto the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Be ye doers of the word, not just hearers only. Hearing is good. Listening and reading is good. But then we're supposed to apply that. Meditating on the word means you're looking into the word to see how you can apply it. How, what can I do with what I've read today and apply it to my life? What do I need to change in my life to line up with this book a little bit better today? That's the meditating on the word. A blessed person meditates on the word. So what are some of the rewards for living a blessed life? The benefits of living a life that is blessed of God are numerous, but there are two that I want to consider today. Ooh, excuse me. Stability and durability. Stability and durability. If we go to Psalms chapter 1, verse 3 of our opening text, stability. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. This, this is really interesting. I've never really thought about it like this until I was reading this lesson. He shall be like a tree planted. That word planted means that this is not just a wild tree, right? It wasn't just a wild tree that some bird pooped out a seed and it planted and it happened to be by the river. This 
was a planted tree. Somebody knew if I put this tree here by the river, the river is going to give it a sustenance. It's going to give it, when the sun comes out, it's not going to dry it up. When the wind comes, its roots are going to be able to be strong enough to hold it in the ground. That stability that somebody knew, if I plant it here, it's going to be stable. It's going to be okay. It's going to have the river to keep it strong. Uh, this is the same way with a person who is blessed of God. A blessed person enjoys the stability of being planted by God. So two things are necessary for the development of a spiritual life. First, a person must be planted in the word of God. That's right. right? First Peter 1 and 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The second thing necessary for the development of a spiritual life is like a tree planted by the river of water, a person must position themselves near life-sustaining source of God's spirit. If we go to John chapter 7 and verse 38, it says that he that believes on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall, river, shall flow rivers of living water. These elements of the word and of the spirit bring to the believer a certain stability that is unshakable. All right, what about durability? I said they were, we're going to focus on two, durability. His leaf, if back in Psalms 1 and chapter 3, his leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he do, does shall prosper. Durability is promised to the blessed person. He's not going to lose his freshness, not going to lose his fruitfulness, in spite of life's circumstances. Doesn't matter what's going on. If you look at, I always call them the three Hebrew boys, but they were probably men. If you look at the three Hebrews that were threatened with the fiery furnace, or with Daniel, when Daniel was threatened with the new law, saying you're not allowed to pray to any other god, and he prayed anyway, or with Paul, who was on death row awaiting his execution, Paul was able to say, I'm ready now. All of this is because of the durability, knowing I've got God on my side. I've got God with me. I'm going to be okay. It doesn't matter what's going to happen around me. Life circumstances might happen. There might be a drought, but I've got that river of living water. I've got that, and it's hold close to that. Amen? The ungodly man. If we go to Psalms chapter 1 and verse 4, it talks about the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff which the wind drives away. The ungodly are not God's planting. God did not plant them. They are like the chaff that is separated from the grain that is blown away by the wind. According to Harper's Biblical Dictionary, chaff was the worthless husk of grain threshed on an old stone threshing floor. The wind blew the chaff away from the grain as it was tossed by harvesters using forks. The Bible reveals that an ungodly man is unstable like chaff, worthless, dead, without substance, and easily carried away. Unable to stand. If we go to Psalms chapter 1 and verse 5, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Now, this is not to say that they're not going to be judged. It's not saying that they won't stand before judge. It means that they literally are not going to be able to stand in judgment. They, they are not going to be able to go to, into glory. They're not going to be... I'm going to go back to my notes because I'm talking in circles. The ungodly person will stand before God. It means that as he stands before God in judgment, he will not have right standing with God. In other words, he will be unable to prevail or endure when God judges him. There will be no one to plead his case, and he will be punished for his ungodly deeds. Continuing, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The sinner shall not stand in the congregation of the righteous. This phrase furthers the thought. 
that the ungodly person will not have right standing with God when God judges him. The way of man. The way of man. Psalms chapter 1 and verse 6. The ending of Psalms chapter 1 says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The Lord knows the whereabouts of his children at all times. God knows where we're at, knows how we're doing, knows what we're doing. Now, some people might find that, like, hang on a second, give me, give me some space. I want to be able to do what I want to do, but that's not, it's, it's actually very comforting. Yeah. Knowing that no matter where I'm at, no matter what I do, God is still there. Job said it in Job 23 and 10, but he knows the way that I take. He is, God is concerned about us and he cares for us. We can read that in the book of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30. It says, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Amen. God cares about us enough that he knows exactly how many hairs are on our head. The way I read that is that he knows which number each one is, right? Like, pulls up, yep, that's number 4,365. This one over here, that's 9,000. I'm just pulling numbers out of the air, but God knows exactly, and they're numbered. Such a, such a minuscule detail. You know, I, I worry about my fingers. I worry about making sure they're not getting cracked not split and open, that they're not too calloused, that they're... I worry about my hands and my fingers because I work with them. Yeah. My hair, you know how much I worry about that? <laughs> Rachel, how's my hair look today? <laughs> That's about all it goes. <laughs> Every now and then, I'll go get a haircut. And so God cares about us enough that the smallest details, he knows exactly how many hairs are on our head. That's how much he cares about us. That's how much... The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The psalmist concluded Psalms chapter 1 with a serious warning that the ungodly shall perish. The New Berkeley version in modern English translates this verse saying, but the way of the ungodly shall end in ruin. The Hebrew word for perish is abad which means to wander away, to lose oneself, to be void of and have no way to flee. So it's not just perish. We think of perish as in die. They mean so much more. To wander away, to lose oneself, to be void of and have no way to flee. No, perish. The hope if we go to Proverbs 10 and 28, the hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. There's a snippet of a story in here talking about a father and son. The little boy walking with his dad, hand in hand, and the dad's walking around town. It's a big city. They go a couple this ways and that ways, and he says, all right, do you know where home is? The little boy says, no. I have no idea where we're at. I have no idea which way home is. The dad says, okay, so then are you lost? The little boy says, no, I'm not lost. I'm with you, daddy. There was, talking about God being everywhere, there was a man that came up to a young preacher. The man said, I'll give you a quarter. I'll give you a quarter if you can prove where God is. The young preacher just fired back and said, I'll give you a dollar if you can prove where God isn't. Yeah. So, if we could all stand, I'm going to wrap up. Living a blessed life is not about materialism. It's not about what we can have or what we might have. It's about making sure that our way is right with God, making sure that we are in line with God's word. Amen? As we are transitioning...